Right. Sure. Um, we'll uh, now hear from uh, Dr. Sandoval uh, from the Mail from Males in Rochester. Is it? All right. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Thank you for having me here. Uh, I think I'm the third perforation sort of case here today, <laughs> but I'll focus on a different one, uh, uh, the management of a distal coronary perforation and some of our, the lessons that uh, we gained from this uh, complex case. So this is a gentleman in his uh, mid-80s with a history of multivessel coronary artery disease, prior complex percutaneous coronary intervention that presented to our center with uh, non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. He had an extensive history of prior complex intervention, including a drug eluding stent to a severely calcified proximal right coronary artery that had required rotational atherectomy 70 years prior, uh, had had since subsequent episodes of ISR requiring repeat PCI on occasion with uh, another drug eluding stent and another one with a plain old eluding angioplasty, and I'll provide more data of this in the following slides. And he had progressed over time to have uh, more uh, anginal symptoms uh, evaluated uh, and identified to have uh, around nine months or so pr prior to this presentation to have severe disease in the left main, proximal LED, ramus, and right coronary artery, but he was deemed a non-surgical candidate, so just nine months prior to this presentation, he had undergone complex multivessel PCI with stent into the left main, proximal distal LED, ramus, and right coronary artery. And now he's presenting with uh, non-ST elevation ACS. There are the pictures here on the, for the left system, and as you can see, it has essentially severe proximal osteal uh, LED, ramus, uh, circ, and some uh, also uh, distal left main disease. This is the right corner artery. As you can see, there's a number of layers of stents, as I mentioned before, dating back to 2009, at which time had a 3 ODES to the proximal RCA, had subsequently 2015 uh, stents to the mid right coronary artery to a 2.5, had had the episodes of ISR, and had undergone balloon angioplasty later in November of 2015, and lately had undergone the last intervention in December of 2015 with a 3 0 and a 3 5 drug eluding stents. So now we're here, and I guess the question is, uh, which, uh, I mean, he was already deemed a non-surgical candidate in the past, now presents with an honest elevation ACS, has severe disease in the left, and also has severe disease here in the mid-right corner artery, and uh, one could argue, which, where do you start? We thought, uh, and people would approach this differently, uh, but we thought we'll start with what we thought was the easiest one, so we decided to start with the right. So can I just ask you a question? Yes. When you say... Uh, you thought it was the easiest one, was the thinking that it would be the easiest to dilate, but in my opinion, as far as decision making, after you dilate, it's the hardest, because you have like all these layers of metal, you're going to decide whether you need laser, do you have brachytherapy back in your lab, right. are you going to put a seventh layer of reloading stent, I mean all these questions start to pop into my head, and I'm like already thinking, yeah I can dilate it, I mm -hmm. get immediate result, that's reasonable, mm -hmm. but then what? Yeah, I thought, I thought at least at this point when we're starting was, uh, at least for the left system, we're anticipating a uh, likely potential complex sure. two-stent two technique. Uh, uh, you know, the patient had preserved TF. We're thinking that maybe no need for support. Uh, but we thought that we could at least get quickly with the right. Sure. Uh, which so just dilate the right. Uh, right, which we'll learn uh, maybe it was not as quick. <clears throat> so... Uh, we proceeded here, uh, since uh, anticipating a more uh, challenging lesion, we upsize to uh, an eight French sheath, eight French catheters. Uh, and as I said, we decided to proceed first with intervention to the right corner artery severe lesion. We just uh, work course wire, run through, and we just uh, initiated with uh, just successful high pressure balloon angioplasty 3020 uh, up to 26 atmospheres. So you can see balloon dilated nicely. Uh, I don't have the full floors of sinus of the subsequent interventions, but they're summarized on the right. And essentially, we did uh, uh, balloon angioplasty with body wire, then went with a 3020, then with a 3520, and we also did a 3510 angioscope at 20 atmospheres. 
And this is how so far things are looking a little bit better. As you can see, we still have the body wire in place, which was a BMW along with the run through. And at this point, we're somewhat happy of how the direction that this is taking. But at some point in between, we notice that there's a stain distally. And we take a picture, and this is what we see. So I'll let it play here so everybody can appreciate this. So there's essentially distal coronary perforation. And at this point, the patient is hemodynamically stable, uh, heart rate of 80, blood pressure in the 150s. Uh, and at this point, we proceed uh, for a static echocardiogram and hemostasis with a proximal balloon. And, and I guess the question, I've shared this case with a number of people uh, in the past, uh, and uh, the question is, is this something that requires uh, uh, an uh, intervention of some sort, or is this something that could be managed conservatively, just hemostasis, or, uh, um, or any thoughts of, uh, on the approach, and then I'll share what we did. I'll tell you what we would do in okay. our lab, Go ahead. is that, you know, I think uh, watchful waiting has not served us well in general mm -hmm. in the past, and usually it's not immediate, it's four hours later. So, uh, my 17, 19, 19, 18 years in the cat lab now, I think I've dealt, I've decided that if you see something like this, typically you used to see it a lot more in the era of 2B3As, and, 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 but we do see it sometimes with our polymer jacket and CTO wires. We have several options. Uh, we keep, uh, we have coils available readily into getting into that uh, PL branch, uh, sub-branch, and basically delivering those. Mm -hmm. You could use uh, you could use glue, you could use autologous blood, you could use fat from the patient's femoral artery, you could use um, you could uh, what you don't want to do is I think uh, ignore it. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> so we would just coil it. We would okay. use one of those Boston Scientific interlocking IDC coils that deliver uh, through a uh, 014. We have a catheter, uh, 018 catheter that we use. And it's available we just, for use in our CTO cart that we would opt and use in this case. And at this time, what was your anticoagulation? Uh, this was just a uh, heparin uh, that we were using in... And uh, you do a lot of Right, correct. Which one? Uh, can't recall. Flavix? Yeah, I think it was Flavix, but can't recall. Yeah, yeah that big guitar. Does, does the storm cloud wash away or does it stay... Uh, nope, it stays, and actually, um, which I might show it in the next, uh, after this one, but I don't want to show what we're saying, but, uh, but uh, it was expanding a little bit more in the subsequent one. So, uh, completely agree, so that was her thought process. We said, like, you know, uh, at this point, even, it, this doesn't look as dramatic as the first case that we, we, we showed, but we said, we don't want to leave this alone, because we're concerned that this might progress over time, the patient might decompensate, even though it's hemodynamically stable right now, and the stat -TT did not show uh, any signs of a pericardial diffusion. So at this point, uh, following the coronary perforation management algorithm, as I said, we did the first two steps, which is provide hemostasis, inflate the balloon uh, to occlude the vessel, static echocardiogram, there is no pericardial synthesis, so now we go to the next step. The next step is identi identify whether this is a large versus a distal vessel wire perforation. And again, this is a distal wire perforation, and we've talked at least two of the potential uh, uh, possibilities, such as coil or fat. So this is what we proceeded to do subsequently. So we advanced uh, transit microcatheter. And as you can see here, I don't know if I can bring the pointer. Let's show you. So this is the vessel where the wire essentially went distally and caused the perforation. But the challenge is how do we wire this tiny branch in order to what we thought was our initial approach to perform fat embolism. Uh, so we were femoral, so for the fat embolism, essentially we took a little bit of essentially fat from the axis side, uh, uh, dumped that into a little bit of contrast, put that on the microcatheter and the transit, and the idea would be that if you are able to put the microcatheter into the branch, that you can essentially embolize and occlude uh, the site of the uh, perforation. We were unable to do this because despite numerous attempts at trying to wire that tiny branch, we could never direct the microcatheter in that direction, and we didn't want to perform fat embolization distally <laughs> to, the, um, to the rest of the vessel. The lesson sometimes that you can do to help is instead of trying to wire with the microcatheter in place, mm -hmm. get this microcatheter is not going to help you. So in a situation like that, 
you want to use like a turnpike or a or supercross or something that will help you with a Xion type wire that allows you to get into angulated small vessels like you would in the CTO situation and then exchange out, put your micro cap in there, there, get your wire into the branch, then switch out and then over that use your torpedo or your uh, whichever micro catheter you have to deliver the coil. Do you think the trim pass could help with two exit points? If you point it out. Yeah, I mean, that's a good option to get a wire. Sure. In, in, in a wire Sure. And I guess let me ask your opinion. In, in a tiny branch like this, could you, would you coil this or? Um, I mean, I don't know if you, I, it would be tough to coil. This looks like it's right. less than a one millimeter branch. Right, that's what we talked to. Or, mm -hmm. or with blood. Yeah, the, the thing I like about, there's two things. One, you, uh, you mentioned, does, does it stain stay there or not? And in the first shot, there was a hint that it did trickle off at the end, but if the stain stays there, then right, it may not be still leaking. But this one is probably still leaking. You see a big hematoma forming right. around. And the fat, I, the reason I kind of like fat is because everybody has it. And <laughs> even if you've never done it before, the first time I did it was right after sitting in a meeting like this when Grantham barely mentioned it at the end of a course, and I thought, I'll never need that. And I needed it two weeks later. And it, it, you can really do it with what you got on your shelves. The 18,000th catheter that you mentioned for your coils sometimes can be great for the fat because it's a little bigger but you just take a little fat out you cut it up real fine you don't you can push it down with fluid or contrast or you can use your benson wire or whatever you have for your for your coil delivery and just push it down if you don't want to push a lot of fluid down and uh, we've talked people through it over the phone and everything else and it works unbelievable and you leave no sign behind there's no you know no, nothing on the x-ray the next day and uh, it's kind of a clean uh, very nice uh, procedure, and it really works. Uh, so. And the good thing is if it's a collateral, for example, if it's a CTO and you are having to abort the procedure, you can come back three months later. You haven't burned your bridge. Exactly. You haven't burned your bridge. Exactly. Can, so, can so I, I have the same experience as you. That the only time I ever had to do that is with a workhorse wire. I don't know what it is about. You think it's safe, but it's not always safe. Well, it's not, not perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I say that, so like here we're you know we're working femoral and it's easier to get the fat, but I guess now most of our cases are at least I'm doing them radial for for the fat out or any I guess you just do have okay. any tips for getting that fat where you're now with that we're yeah, radial. Even your radio. Just do a fat fat bar. Just do that one. <laughs> yeah, it's so easy to get the fat. Uh, you just make your incision about another. You have to make a little more of an incision for your arteriotomy. Mm -hmm. So you could do it in the arm, or you could just quickly prep so a little spot on the, the arm. Line. Come. Uh, yeah, my case was radial, and I, I, I nicked the groin, and it just wouldn't stop bleeding. I ended up having a surgical <laughs> station. Right, because the ones that, I, that, I, the ones that I've done have to be femoral, so it's easier because you dissect and pull a little bit more fat, yeah. but I was just sure radial. All right, so we're here. We were unsuccessful with that. So at this point, we're wondering, okay, so not for coil, not for fat. Could we do a cover stent here? Uh, that it's crossing our mind. And just... To bring that to, to thought, these are the available uh, cover stent uh, diameters in the market. So the, the smallest one is 2.8 to uh, largest one is 4.8. And uh, as you clearly saw, that's a tiny looking vessel. And um, in addition to that, I think I might bring this here, right in the next slide, is if you look at the manufacturer recommendations, it will give you uh, guidelines of what are the guide catheters that you should use. But this is taking into account that this is just for the delivery of the cover stent, whereas uh, most of the um, thought processes that you still have to maintain hemostasis, for which reason it, it is taught that you do a ping-pong technique in which you keep one guide with the balloon, you're doing hemostasis, you get another axis, you bring another guide, and you use that one to deliver the uh, copper stent. And that's what we're thinking, but at this point, we're femoral with an eight French um, guide. Uh, so at this point, we maintain hemostasis, and through the same single French guide catheter, our thought was, let's use the copper stent to seal the perforation. So what we did is, through the single guide, we had two wires, one wire that we used to advance the cover stent, and in the other guide, and in the other corner guide wire, we had the balloon that was performing continuous uh, proximal hemostasis. So what we learned, and I think we actually uh, learned it after the fact, when we realized that we didn't do ping pong, was that we were able to maintain at all times proximal hemostasis, deflated the balloon, 
and after deflated load simultaneously advanced to the other corner guide wire that stand to the position where the perforation was and delivered the cover stent through the single eight French without without the need to do a ping pong. And this is the we were able to successfully seal that at this operation as shown here. Let me see if it's not looping as shown on the right. So what we learned for this distal vessel wire perforation is that in addition to coils or fat embolization, the cover stand for sealing the side of the vessel perforation is another option that could be considered. We recently uh, reported this in an algorithm in CCI that essentially describes what we do. Uh, that essentially if you have a eight French large bore guide, you can, are able to have both the balloon at the same time as you are advancing the cover stand to ceiling without allowing for much time on deflation to, uh, to for, that, um, for that perforation and hematoma to expand. I've shared this with a couple of colleagues and uh, one told me like, do you, do you even need to have ongoing proximal hemostasis? Can you just, you know, do, do, do have a pause pull the wire, bring the cover stent. I'm not sure if anybody would do that, but at least the teachings that I've had has been that to maintain ongoing proximal hemostasis. So I'm not sure if someone would bother about the ping pong or would just say like, let's, we're just gonna switch the balloon and bring it out, take a, you know, a few seconds of a pause and just a cover, advance a cover stent following that. I mean, I think this one's not a huge perf, so you're not like the ones that were shown earlier where you, mm -hmm. where you can't leave it can't leave it down for 10 seconds hardly, but this one you can probably, mm -hmm. you could go either way, I think. All right. I mean, I think it all depends on the hemodynamic consequence of the perforation. Mm -hmm. in, in, the, in that first case, did you, did you do ping pong or that one, or? No, I actually didn't. I the, tapped the just pericardium and the impeller was helpful because each time mm -hmm. was the pressure drop, mm -hmm. so you would end I was up wondering about more out of the pericardial space and the impeller would maintain the pressure, so it would give me like that extra bit to get this thing done. Mm -hmm.